right. Good morning, everybody. Welcome back. So today's a fun day, because we get to talk, continue talking about interfaces, and we also get to show you how powerful it is to implement this simple comparison operator. Um, so this is an example of, you know, how interfaces work in Java, why we're talking about them this semester, this idea that, and this is, this is, a, this is a slippery idea. It's a slippery concept. I understand that, you know, people are struggling with it a little bit. Um, that's good. That's why we're talking about it, right? We'll give you more practice at doing this as we go along. Okay, so first thing is, the midterm grades were up on the grading page five minutes ago, and then something broke. So I will fix that after class. Um, but they are done. They are there. I, you know, I, I, I could fix it now, but I think you guys would prefer to listen to me talk about interfaces. So as soon as class is over, we'll have those up. They'll definitely be available for you to see. Um, there are no letter grades assigned. We don't do that. We don't assign letter grades at midterm time. Um, but you will be able to see where you are within the distribution of students in the class, right? Um, we have, um, we're gonna show, we have statistics up showing both sort of with and without drops as well. Um, one thing I would caution you about um, is if there's a big disparity between your score with drops and without drops, just be careful because what that means is that the drops are hiding some pretty bad scores. And if you, you know, if you miss another quiz or whatever, some of those bad scores are gonna start to pop out, and they're gonna start to be included in your average. So for example, let's say you've missed three quizzes already, so you got a zero on those, you're dropping those, you miss another one, now you're gonna see your quiz average drop quite substantially because one of those zeros is no longer gonna be covered by the drop policy. It's gonna be included. So if you have questions about these, I mean, obviously, it's hard to have questions before you can see the information, so, but I'll be um, around today in my office after class for a couple hours, and then certainly available on the forum and stuff like that if you guys have, have questions about this. But, um, but yeah, these, these will be up, and we'll, we'll maintain this information for the rest of the semester. We'll also start showing breakdowns for different parts of the class, individual grade components, and stuff like that. Overall, I mean, I, th I think people are doing quite well. Like I said, uh, you know, the, the both distributions with and without drops are, um, are, are pretty, pretty acceptable to me. And it's very clear to me you guys are putting in the time and effort to do well in the class. Can I talk instead of you guys? Yeah, thank you. No, so there's no new homework problem today. There was the homework problem that I released on Wednesday and then broke on Wednesday afternoon, um, which people seem to notice. Then there was the homework problem that came out yesterday. There was no new homework problem for today. So the homework problem that was released yesterday is due today. So there are two homework problems on interfaces. I would really encourage you guys to do those. And we're gonna talk about one of them today in class. I'll release that one after class so you guys can work on it as part of the 125 problem set. Um, but both of those homeworks are designed to be really sort of highly complementary in terms of how you guys approach interfaces. It's strangely loud in here today. Can you guys? I, c I can hear you up here. Right. Thank you. All right. Onward. So we introduced this concept on Monday, I think, but I want to talk about it again, and we're going to do some examples, because this is, and, and I, because I've kind of seen what people have been doing as part of the homework problems, and I know this is a difficult thing uh, to understand and get right. This is one of the first times when we're really introducing um, a, a, a really high-level conceptual idea about how we build computer systems and how we build computer software. And so even if you've had a fair amount of experience with working with computer programs, or even with Java, this type of thing can be new and a little bit unfamiliar. So an interface in a software system is, is a boundary between two things, and sometimes it, it, can, it serves both as a place where there's interaction and communication, where there has to be coordination. People on one side of the interface have to agree with people on the other side of the interface about how certain things are going to happen.
Thank you. So there's communication at the interface, there's information that's being passed back and forth. There's coordination, there are expectations. So the implementer of an interface has to do certain things, and the person who uses that implementation is able to do certain things, but not other things. So there's limits sort of placed on, on both sides that are important to this. Um, and what this really is designed to facilitate is independence. So this idea that if you implement an interface, then there's a bunch of code out there in the world that can use your class in a new way, and we're gonna talk about that later in the class. If you use a particular interface, you declare a method that says to Java, I need objects that implement this particular interface, now you've acquired a capability. There is something that you can do with any object that's passed to that method, right? So again, sort of on, on both sides of this, between the user and the provider, the two homework problems that you guys worked on this week were designed to give you experience with both sides of that, with providing an interface and then with using that interface. Okay. So there's a bunch of different places where we find computer interfaces, but the ones that we're gonna concern us today are, are in Java. And so remember, a Java interface looks a lot like an empty method. And this is intentional, right? There's actually something really um, important to notice here, right? Which is that I'm telling you the function signature of a method. So this is really all I need to know to figure out how to call the method. And when I add documentation to this, which is critical at interfaces, I have to have documentation. Now I know how to call this particular method or whatever methods this interface provides. I also know what I expect to happen. If I'm the user of the interface, now I know how I can interact with a particular class. If I'm the provider of the interface, now I know what I'm expected to do, what the semantics of this call are, right? But the implementation is not here, and that's exactly kind of the point, right? Which is an interface specifies how this call gets made, but it doesn't specify how this function is supposed to work, what the details are of how it's implemented. So I understand how to make a particular method call, and the provider understands what it's supposed to do, and the user understands what they can do with it, but there's no implementation because that's up to you when you implement an interface. And that's, you know, you might think, well, why? I mean, this seems like a pain. The whole idea here is that how, this, how these interfaces work varies from class to class. And so by providing it, you are able to make it work in the way you want, in the way that's appropriate for, for your class, and we have a great example of that later in the slides. Okay? So, you know, mostly what we're talking about here is interfaces that declare methods. You can also declare variables. Those are static by default, so they're really just constants. When I declare that I implement an interface, I'm required to implement the methods that that interface provides. So I have to, you know, provide an implementation, right? So once I do that, then I fulfilled my part of the contract, right? So w once I do this, I've held up my end of the bargain as the provider of the interface, and then the user of the interface also has to hold up their end of the bargain. Their end of the bargain is there's, they need to use the interface in the way it was intended. If you don't use a particular interface correctly, you're going to get incorrect results. So there's, there's uh, expectations on both sides of this. All right, so you know, we did some examples of this. Okay, so, so this is something that you know, uh, people tripped up people a little bit uh, when they were working on uh, the homework that's out today, which is that like objects, I can upcast object references to any of the interfaces that they implement. So here what I'm doing is I'm declaring an interface called add that has a single, that requires that the class implement a single method called add that takes two ints. Adder is the implementation, or is a class that implements that particular interface. But down on line 12, what you see I'm doing is the right side of line 12 is creating an adder. It's creating a new object of type adder. I can't create an interface. I have to create an object. But the left side 
is receiving a reference that's an interface type. Okay? That's weird. Right? We, we, this made sense with upcasting, right? It was like I could, Java would automatically upcast to any of my ancestors. So I can upcast to object always. I can upcast, you know, to my parent if I have a parent, or my parent's parent if I'm several levels down in the tree. But this is sort of new. But I can also upcast to an interface. And that upcast or that reference works in the same way that we've been talking about when we talk about objects, which is that because I have a reference of type add, what can I do with it? What are the things that I know that I can do with that variable? Adder might provide a bunch of methods, right? I could add like six or seven more methods to adder. And if I created an object of type adder, I could call, if I used a reference of type adder, I could call those methods. But when I use a reference of type add, what methods can I call? Yeah. Just add. That's it. I'm limited to the methods that are part of the interface. But I also know that I can call methods that are part of the interface. So just want to make sure you understand that this is both a limitation, but it's also, um, it's a capability, right? It means that any function that takes a reference of type add knows that that object that's passed in has to implement a function called add that takes two ints as arguments. And so I can use that, right? This is very similar to object type upcasting, all right? And again, same restrictions apply. When I upcast to a parent type, when I use a reference that's an upcasted reference, I can no longer call methods that are implemented by the object, but not implemented by every object that um, is of that reference type. So if I upcast to object, I can use equals, I can use toString, but I can't use any custom methods that the object might provide. In order to do that, I have to downcast it again, and I have to figure out how to do that safely. Okay. So, and again, this, this example, Oh, right, okay, so I haven't implemented multiply yet. Um, ah, right, sorry. My own example is confusing me. So, so again, what, what's happening here? So, line 14, the right side creates an object of type adder. So adder implements a method called multiply. It's right there. But because I'm using a reference of type add, I can't call multiply on line 17. Because multiply is not part of the add interface. If I change this to type adder, then I can call both. Okay, so if I have a reference of type adder, then Java allows me to call both methods. If I upcast that to the interface that adder implements the add interface, I can only call methods that are part of that interface. Is there a question over here, or are you stretching? You're stretching, good. Okay, questions are okay, too. So again, we talked about the fact that this was really, it seems really similar to inheritance, right? And we pointed out that we can actually have abstract classes in Java. This is not something that we're gonna really ask you to do, and this is one of these, like, kind of really advanced features in terms of Java class design. Some of you may go on. This is one of the, kind of the criticisms of Java as a language, right? I've heard these jokes about, you know, to do simple things in Java, I need like 20 different classes of which 16 of them are abstract that don't implement anything. They're just to organize other stuff, right? But some of you may go on and work on large Java projects, and one thing you'll find is that there's like a lot of classes, and a lot of them don't do a lot, right? They're kind of there just to organize other classes, right? Or to provide requirements for other classes. So I don't implement something, I just provide an abstract class with some abstract methods, and then I force other classes to um, extend it, and then they have to provide those methods. So it's sort of almost like an interface. So this is a little bit like inheritance. Um, and, you know, again, once we introduce abstract classes, it's very much like inheritance, because I can actually mark a class abstract, I can mark its methods abstract, and then I can only extend it, so that's sort of like an interface. I can't create a new interface. I can't, you know, if I go back here, I can't do new add. This won't work. 
I can't instantiate add, it's an interface. It can't be created. Same thing with it, but this would be also true if I had an abstract class, right? So I can create, I could do it this way, right? So why interfaces? What's better about them? And how are they different from inheritance? So a couple things. So the, the first thing that's important is that if you think about how Java's object hierarchy works, and this is a good chance for us to review, if you take every object that has ever been created in every Java program, you can organize them all into a single tree with one root. And where I put things in the tree, you know, so, so I might have a case where I have an object where it's like, I want it to, I want it to have to have some features of one part of the tree, but also some features of another part of the tree. And in Java, it doesn't, Java doesn't support multiple inheritance, and there's, there's no way to say in Java that I extend two different classes. Does anyone know why this is, or one of the reasons? Why, what, what, what complications might this cause? If I, and other languages do allow you to do this, and they just have to deal with this problem. But what gets complicated about it? Yeah, so, so remember when Java resolves method names, it looks in the current class, it looks for static methods, then it goes up to the parent class. Keeps doing that until it gets to object, until it finds the method, or it gets to object, doesn't find the method, and fails. If I have two parents, then it's like, which direction do I go? And if, what happens if both of my parents implement the method with the same name? Which one do I choose? I think this is sometimes referred to as the triangle problem or something like that, right? Because I have this, I can have this bifurcation in the tree where I'm looking for a method named foo and parent A provides food and parent B provides foo, so how do I choose which method to, to use? Yeah, so, so there's some, there's some, uh, this can cause some confusion. I just want to point out quickly that interfaces don't solve this problem. So one of the, the interesting things about Java interfaces is you can have two Java interfaces that require that an object implement a method with the same signature, right? And in that case, there's just no solution to that problem, right? Imagine that interface A says you have to implement foo and have it do this, and interface B says you have to implement foo and have it do something else, what do I do, right? The solution is don't do that. Right, don't have the interfaces have that problem. So again, unlike classes, where I have to extend one class, a class of Java can, sorry, unlike my parent, where I can only have one, a class in Java can implement multiple interfaces. So here's an example of, you now I've taken my original adder class, and now I'm adding more mathematical methods to it, so I've got an interface called add that requires that I implement a method called add. I've got an interface called subtract that requires that I implement a method called subtract. And mathy can implement both. What does it mean to implement multiple interfaces? It means that I have to implement all the methods with the right signature required by all of the interfaces that I declare. Yeah, it's, it's pretty simple. Again, if the interfaces start to have, if the interfaces start to have collisions, you know, I'm, I'm, that, that can cause problems. But as long as the interfaces don't overlap, then I provide some functions to implement one interface, I provide some more function, I provide some more functions to implement another interface. I can implement multiple interfaces, I can implement as many as I want. So again, here's an example of this. Um, now, now again, it's a, it, here's an interesting point, right? So what am I, so I, now I have a mathy class that implements both add and subtract. But what's the reference type that I'm using on line 17? So I've upcast mathy to what type? Yeah, to an add. So can I call subtract on it? Nope. Why not? Because subtract isn't defined in the add interface to find in the subtract interface. So this is actually a kind of a, I, I just want to point out, I usually try not to show you guys bad code in class. That's kind of one of my principles about how to teach a course like this. But this is kind of dumb. Like, don't do this. You know, don't, oh, one interface implements add, and another implements subtract. So now when I create a mathy object, I have to decide am I going to use it for addition or subtraction. That's, that's sort of dumb, right? 
The better thing to, would be to have all of these methods as part of a simple, like, integer arithmetic interface, and then force the function, the, the class to implement all of them. If, but if I want, with this kind of dumb example, to do some subtraction, then I have to declare that the reference is a reference to a subtract class. Questions about this? Again, this is, uh, this is sli slippery stuff. Yeah, Jeremy. We're getting there. Great question. So the, so the question was, how do these interfaces allow communication between different parts of your code? Well, one way they do is that the interface, so when the user of the interface calls add, they're providing me with some information, right? They're providing me with two integers. And then they're expecting me to provide them with some information, which is the two integers added together. So there's actual data that flows across an interface, just like there's data that flows across every time you make a function call. When you call a function, you provide some information as arguments, you get some information back, potentially, if it's not void, as a return value. But there's also kind of a deeper type of communication that goes on at an interface. And that has to do with expectations, wh how something works. So interfaces really represent a contract. This is a good way to think about them. Between the provider of the interface, that's the class that implements it. And then anyone who uses the class in that way. So provider is a class that implements an interface. User is a class that uses an instance of that object as that interface type, or relies on the fact that it provides a particular interface, or implements a particular method as part of the interface, right? And what's really important about this is that, you know, so, the, the world of software development and computer science that you guys are, you know, that I'm trying to launch you into is enormous. And it's awesome. It's huge. There's millions of people all over the world that are doing this kind of stuff, that are passionate about the same type of things that you care about, that are building things and sharing them with other people. You guys are a part of that. I think that's actually incredibly cool. When I was a kid, you know, there was no GitHub. There was no, you know, there were all, not all these online forums where people were, like, incredibly helpful. Um, we had this happen a couple times last semester. We, we had problems with our discourse installation that we use as a forum. And I actually had some of the discourse developers volunteer to log on to our forum to, like, find out what's going wrong. The amount of money we pay discourse for this privilege? Zippo. It's just people being friendly, right? People that, and, and also people that have built things that are proud of them. Right? So when it's like, I have a problem with your software, they're like, I want to fix this, right? So, th so they get involved. Anyway, but how do, we com how do we coordinate our efforts in this huge world of software, right? You know, we want all of the work that we all do to be additive. And in many ways, it is incredibly additive. The kind of things that you can build quickly today, um, and you guys are going to find this out as you work on your final project, the kind of things that you can build quickly today by standing on the shoulders of other people and by following other examples and using other people's code and libraries and ideas are really incredible. But how do we, how do we get this to work? Right? How do we set this up so that we can all work on stuff without getting in each other's way? So that I can build one thing and you can build another thing, and those two things can work together well. One of the ways we do that is by setting up good interfaces. So an interface represents the agreement that you and I need to come to so that we can work independently on something, so that I can build one thing and you can build something else, and when we're done, those two things work together effectively. So let's look at an example of this. And this is one of these things that is just shockingly powerful, okay? So this is an actual Java interface. It's called Comparable. You can look it up. It's implemented by a bunch of different Java classes. What does it mean for an object to be comparable. When you implement comparable, what are you signing up to do? When you implement comparable, you're agreeing that you can compare two instances of your class. So if I give you one instance of your class and another, you can essentially tell me if the first is greater than the second 
second is less than the first, or if they're the same. That's it. You're essentially giving me three, I'm giving you three choices, greater than, equal, or less than. That's it. And I'm asking this about two instances. So you can imagine, you know, I give you two instances of your class, and it's like right hand or left hand, or both, right? Which one's bigger? And you can say they're the same, or you can say right hand or left hand. That's it. But by implementing this, you unlock this incredible power, because there's so much cool stuff you can do as soon as you can compare two objects to each other. Being able to do this enables pretty much almost everything we're gonna talk about through the rest of the semester, all of these cool data structures and algorithms that we're gonna work with and think about and analyze, all of them, a lot of them, rely on this problem, okay? If you provide this, here's some of the things that I can do, and we'll come back and talk about a few of these in a minute. I can sort. So sorting is something that sounds very simple, but it turns out to be an incredibly powerful primitive for building other types of algorithms. If I can compare two objects, I can sort n objects. And all I need to be able to do to sort n objects is compare two. I can write a sorting algorithm that just compares two at a time. That's it. So you do this, I can sort. And it turns out, again, by sorting, there's a bunch of other cool algorithms I can build on top of that, right? I can also do things like find the max, right? You're telling me how to compare two objects, which is bigger. And so I can apply that across a bunch of objects to figure out which is the maximum. Again, this is one of these building blocks that I can use as part of other algorithms. Right? So you, by defining an order between two items, you enable sorting, and you also enable me to produce a well-defined maximum over a set of elements from, of your class. I, there's also a bunch of data structures that we're gonna talk about that I can now create, simply because I can compare two instances. So again, this is one of these things that just sort of like blows your mind a little bit, that something this simple turns on all of this, this cool, these cool capabilities. That's all you have to do, is tell me how to compare two instances of your object. Once you've done that, so remember, our goal here is to enable this really beautiful world of parallel development, where you and I agree on something, and then you go off and you do your work, and I go off and I do my work, and our, our work works together seamlessly. Our work interoperates perfectly. The things that you do make the things that I do more powerful, and the things that I do make the things that you do more powerful, right? That's a win-win for everybody. So how does this work with an interface? The idea here is that this, this point of contact, right, this place where there's communication that happens, where there's coordination that happens, is also a barrier. It's also a place where I don't have to think, if, if I'm the user of an interface, I'm not supposed to think about how you implemented the interface. That's your problem. If I'm the implementer of the interface, I don't think about how you use my interface. That's your problem. So again, this, this place where these two things come together is also a boundary, right? It's also a border. It's a place where I don't have to, I don't have to go and worry about all the code that you wrote. Your code is on one side, my code's on the other, and, you know, I, I don't have to cross that barrier. I shouldn't have to cross that barrier if we set up our interfaces correctly. That's the goal. If you have to think about what I'm doing all the time and I have to think about what you're doing all the time, then we don't have a very good interface, because the interface is supposed to provide this separation. Um, okay. So, let's talk about our first example of imp interface implementation, which was the, I don't know if that number is right, homework 35, homework 34, I can't remember, but, um, so what we asked you to do is Create a, class, create a class called stringleg and implement comparable. And essentially, stringleg just wraps a string. I create it by passing a string argument, it stores that string, and then it compares to other instances of itself in the following way. So if the instance is null or some other object, then I return negative one, and it turns out that this is a little bit of a corruption of the actual compare to interface, but we'll talk about some of the details about how this should actually work a little bit later, because it requires some concepts that we haven't discussed yet. 
So negative one, if the other object is less than me, meaning that its string length is less than mine, zero if its string length is equal to mine, and one if its string length is greater than mine. And then I'm also gonna put a bunch of these cases that I don't wanna handle into the negative one bin, like if it's null or not a, not a string. All right, so let's, let's do this. So the first thing I have to do is I have to declare that I implement comparable. And I actually don't even think I need this interface here because this is a standard Java interface. Right, and so the first error message I get is that I didn't implement compare to. I told you I was gonna implement this interface and I didn't implement the method that I needed to do, to, okay? So, but the first thing I have to do is actually think about how the string length is, is going to be created and set up. So I'm gonna create a private string variable. I'll just call it string. And I'm gonna create a constructor that takes a string and says string is equal to set string. All right, so now I've got a way to create new instances of string length. Let's make sure this works down here. I'll say string length, string length is equal to new string length, and I gotta give it a string, so I'll give it, oh, okay. I'll, we'll come back to this. Let's just get rid of this for a minute so I can test. Okay, good. All right, so now I'm gonna go back and say I'm gonna implement comparable. Now I have this problem again. So now I have to create my public int compare to, and I take an object reference as the thing to compare against. And for now, let's just return zero to make sure that this works. Okay. So, so what have I done here? I've declared by implementing comparable that there is a meaningful order for instances of this class. Now I have to tell you what it is. So according to the specification, if other is equal to null or other is not a string length, it's supposed to return negative one, okay? So at this point, I know that I can downcast this to a string length safely because I've done this check. Let me use something like this. Okay. So now let's do string length other is equal to string length. Oh. Okay, so that still works. Let's just try this for fun. We'll do, uh, String length dot compare to null. Hopefully it gives me negative one. Let's try to compare it to something that's not a string length. Also gives me negative one. Okay, good. Okay, so I've got that part down. Now what the, the semantics of this said, and, and, and com I, I may get this backwards. Compare to is one of those interfaces that it's easy to get, oops. Who is messaging me during class? String length is one of those interfaces where it's easy to get, sorry, compared to is one of those interfaces that's easy to get backwards, right? Um, let's try not to do that. Let's see here. If other is less than, okay, so I'm gonna say if other dot string. Now, here's the thing, I have to get the length of that other string. Dot length is less than string dot length return negative one, else if other dot string dot length is greater than string dot length, return one, else return zero. And I can, should be able to get rid of this return statement now. Okay, good. That's it. So again, I didn't have to do much here. And normally when you implement a compare to, you don't have to do very much. That's the cool thing. But there's a lot of code out there waiting in the world. There's a lot of code out there in the world, in the Java world, waiting for you to implement this interface that's gonna start to work as soon as you do. All right, so let's just do a couple of these to make sure that I believe that this works. So let's compare it to, 
a new string length that has a shorter length. Oh, I think I'm missing a, okay. So that means that the other is less than me and has a shorter length. Let's try something that has an equal length. So again, I'm not comparing the strings. These two strings are not the same. They're different, but they have the same length. All right? And now, okay. So what else can I do here? So now that I have a, so now that I have a, something that implements comparable, I can actually treat it like something that implements comparable. So I can upcast it to a comparable reference, and it works the same way. Because I'm using the method that's part of the comparable interface. Any questions about this before we go on? So this is an example of implementing, providing an interface, yeah. So, okay, so I, I'm gonna, I think what the question is, is if the, if an object already implements compared to, can you just use it? Yeah. No, 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 no. So this is what's so, okay, so this is what's so critical. If an, if an existing class implements an interface, you can use it. You don't write it. The person who wrote the class writes it, right? But you can use the methods that are part of it. So in this case, we're the authors of string length. This is our class, right? And so if I want to provide comparable, I have to implement it. But if I'm using somebody else's class, so for example, string already provides compare to. I can just use it. I don't have to implement it. It's implemented by the class designer. Right, so when you're the provider, so if you're, so, so let's talk about cases where you would probably provide an interface. If you design a class to do something, to represent some information, and you want it to be sortable, and you want it to be uh, searchable in certain efficient ways, then if you can show Java how to compare two instances, then you can enable that. There's another question over here. Yeah. <laughs> ah, yeah, let's come back to that. The question was, what's the difference between comparable and not equals? Right? I think I have a slide on this, actually. All right, hold on. Great question. Good segue here. We'll come back and do the, the previous slide in a minute. So you, you might have noticed something here. In Java, every object provides a dot equals method that allows me to determine whether or not it's equal to another object. And either I can override that method or I can inherit it from my parent or from object, but every Java object has it. Every Java object does not have a compare to method. It's part of a separate interface. So in Java, I can implement compare to to tell Java that you can compare me to, to another instance of that class, but I don't have to. Why? So equals is mandatory. Being comparable is optional, useful, helpful, extremely useful. I've been just telling you all these really useful things that you can do once you implement compare to. So why isn't it part of object? Why doesn't Java require that every single object implement this? It would just be such a beautiful world if that were the case. Why isn't that true? So there is a problem, right. The problem is that not every class supports a meaningful notion of what it means to compare two things to each other, right? So what about some of the classes we've been talking about in class? We've been using these silly classes, right? Give me an example of a, of a class that you don't think should implement compare to, that can't implement compare to. It doesn't make any sense. I heard something over here. 
Say that one more time. Sweet old dog, right. It's good. It's like, what is he talking about? Dog, cat. Yeah, how do you compare two pets? That doesn't make any sense. You can't sort my cat and my dog. They would be very upset by that, actually. Um, I mean, both of them think that you can sort them, but they have differences in what the order should be. Um, yeah, that doesn't mean, it doesn't make any sense. There's certain things in the world that aren't comparable to each other in a meaningful way. I can't put them in order. You know, so there are some things where it's like, or if I do, it's arbitrary, right? So if I take a bunch of people, I could sort them by height, but is that fundamental to who you are? No. I could sort you by age. Is that fundamental to who you are? No. I could sort you by IQ level. Is that fundamental to who you are? No. Right? I could sort you by where you sit in Follinger every day. Is that, like, none of those are really essential to who you are as a person. So if I created a person class that had some of those attributes, it's not clear that there's a meaningful way to sort it. Right? So in order for something to be sortable, it really needs to have a, a fixed definition of what it means to, to compare two instances, and that has to be meaningful. And there's cases where it's not. Right? So there's some classes I can sort, some classes I can't. On the other hand, equality is kind of fundamental. So the, the question was, what's the difference between, you know, uh, compare to and, and not equals, right? So when Java was designed, and I don't think this is a bad decision, essentially the, the, the language designer said, look, every class has to support some meaning, some definition of equality. It can be a very limited definition. So if you use the default object dot equals method, what it does actually is it tests whether or not the two references are to the same object. So if I have two references to the same object, and I compare them to each other using dot equals, what I'm really doing is I'm comparing the object to itself. If an object is not equal to itself, then there's just something strange about that object, then may maybe we should kick it out of Java, right? Um, so, so fun like, fundamentally, and, and your class can provide a broader definition of equality, but fundamentally there's some notion of equality that makes sense for all objects, which is that, at minimum, an object is equal to itself. Again, you can define dot equals in other ways. You can say two pets are equal if they have the same name. You can say two cars are equal if they have the same model or whatever. Like, you, you can override that, you can make it more general, but at minimum, if I have two references to the same object, then that object should be equal to itself. So does, does this answer your question? I can't necessarily sort things. But if you give me something and ask me, is it equal to itself? I think the answer is always true. Like I said, if you want to be a big joker, you can implement equals and have it return false. And I suspect there's a bunch of things in Java that will just stop working at that point, right? Because they'll be like, you no, know, so for example, let's say that there's a, a function in Java that's looking for an object in an array, and you've defined dot equals to be false. It will never find that object, ever, right? It's always going to return null, because you've said that two objects are never equal, even if they're the same object, literally two references to the exact same thing. Yeah, question. Can you do no, 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 no. Great question. Okay. This is, th these are awesome questions. Let me, let me go back and talk about this. So I, I really want to try to drive this distinction home, and I'll keep working on it on Monday, but there is this distinction between using and providing an interface. If you design a class and you want it to be comparable, you have to provide the interface by implementing compare to. If you want to use another class that provides compare to, you don't have to do anything. You just use the method that it provides. So this was something that tripped up people on today's homework. If you implemented compare to as part of your max class, it did nothing. We never even used it. It's just hanging out there. If you did that, try just deleting it from your code and see if it works. You also will have to delete that Max implements comparable. Max doesn't need to implement comparable. Max uses comparable. So let's look at an example of, of this. I don't think we have time to do this fully. Well, actually, hold on. Why don't we do this? Let me go back and grab this guy. So 
So I'm going to show you an example here of, if I have time, of using an interface. And again, I don't need this interface definition. So my, I have my existing string length class that, okay, that implements this compare to method. And now I'm going to create an array of them. I'm going to create, oh, I should have picked a smaller class name. Bad feeling about this. Like we're going to be doing this on Monday. It's awesome, actually, because this is cool stuff. All right. Okay. Check this out. So, what did I just do here? I've got a class that implements comparable. That class is like somewhere else in the in the universe. Just forget that it's on the slide. Maybe if I here, I'll just throw some white space in here so we can make it go away. There we go. It's gone. All right. I have a method on this class called example. This example does not implement comparable. I have a method called maximum. That maximum method takes an array of things that can be compared to each other. So it takes, this will accept an array of anything in Java that can be compared where the two objects can be compared to each other. I could pass it a string length, I could pass it strings, I could pass it integers, I could pass it all sorts of things. There's like hundreds of classes in Java that implement comparable. I can pass an array of any one of them to my maximum function. And where we'll pick up on Monday is that I can implement maximum now in a way that works for any class that can be comparable. So when we come back on Monday, I will show you how to implement this maximum method over an array of comparable objects. And when we're done, we will have code that will work with hundreds of different Java classes automatically. It's, and it's entirely general. So again, this is something that will, so, so if you're, if you're feeling a little lost, you're feeling confused, I know this is slippery stuff. It's also super important. Trust me, when you guys get down to, uh, 225, you will thank me that we talked about this because this is a lot of the types of things that people struggle with in this class, in that class, right? We'll come back, we'll, f we'll talk about this more on Monday, but we're also going to use these ideas as we start talking about algorithms and data structures next week. So next week, we move into a new phase of the class. We're going to start talking about algorithm runtime. We're going to talk about data structures. We're going to build some data structures and algorithms together and talk about how they work and how they perform. And along the way, we're going to do them using these types of Java interfaces so that we can make them as general as possible. All right? I have a couple of announcements. So MP4 is out today. It's due soon. Please get started on it. I'll have office hours now. I will go run back to my office and fix the uh, grading interface so you guys can see what's going on there. Um, if you have feedback about the class, the form is still online. Hope you guys have a wonderful weekend. I will see you on Monday. <laughs>